great. Fantastic. So we'll go ahead and start. Uh, welcome to our final panel uh, titled Reports from the Field, um, whose title itself, I like to think, crystallizes concerns that percolated throughout the conference about the genres in which we report, write, present, and share insights and experiences, as well as the fields in which or from which we do that sharing. Over the past two days, we've been asked to consider fields of both knowledge and practice as they coexist in constant, if troubled, conversation. And the hope is that we may together, with the help of a series of multi-generic accounts from scenes of practice, we may hope to, hopefully together have a final but opening conversation about the ways physical spaces, professional spaces, personal as well as epistemic spaces intersect and inform the way we think about and do science, medicine, and health. We'll hear from three programs, Arts and Minds at the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Narrative Medicine Program in projects at Bellevue Hospital in New York and the VA, and the Hubbard Program run through the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And then we'll, have, we'll open up for about 15 minutes of Q&A. So we'll start with Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn Halpin Healy is an educator and arts administrator. Uh, since 1991, she has taught at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And in 2010, she founded Arts and Minds with neurologist James Noble to provide museum-based programs for people with dementia as well as their caregivers. Art and Minds partners with art museums such as the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Metropolitan um, Museum of Art, and the um, New York Historical Society to develop programs rooted in the aesthetic experience. And she will give us an account from that yeah. work. Okay. So a little story uh, about Arts and Minds. Um, but first, thank you very much to Eileen Galuli for inviting me here today, this weekend. And thanks to all of you for your wonderful papers and presentations. Um, it's really been very expanding. Um, so Arts and Minds is a project, um, as Alvin just mentioned, um, that started a few years ago. So this, this practice of bringing people with dementia to the art museum is something that began, well, it began a long time ago if the people at a facility thought to ask the question and ask the museum to receive them. And at the Met, we did that for many, many years. Um, but in about 2006, museums began designing kind of open call programs, open to the public for people to sign themselves up and come to the museum. Um, and this, this is a picture that I've come to think of as the, the birthday of Arts and Minds. Um, and I'm teaching on the, the, I'm part of the teaching team at the Metropolitan Museum of Art that founded that the program there in 2008. Um, and that's the James Noble in the background there who is, who is mentioned uh, by, by uh, Rachel just a moment ago. Um, he came to the Met that day um, so between a fellowship and taking up a clinical appointment at Harlem Hospital. And he had been interested in the course of disease and how that affects creativity over time as disease progresses. Um, but in the studio that day, he realized what was happening between the care partners and he was moved to think, this is something that can make a difference for my patients now. Um, and so he invited me to work together with him to start Arts and Minds. Um, and so we ran a pilot at the Studio Museum in Harlem um, on a small grant from the Friends of Harlem Hospital. And we quickly realized that this is a program that could have impact beyond that single museum, um, and also that we couldn't be a priority for Harlem Hospital in terms of funding. So we uh, decided that we would establish a not-for-profit organization. Um, and this has been running now since 2010. Each program invites people to the museum, um, and they all begin with a warm welcome. So the idea is for people to, we want to take them out of their isolation, invite them to a place where they're warmly welcomed, um, and where they will be brought into contact with art in a place of culture. 
So we always begin in the gallery. The first portion of the program is about aesthetic experience. It's about response and interpretation of works of art. So we create the situation um, whereby we get to hear from people what they have to say about these pictures. Um, and in this milieu, it's, it's really quite exciting. The woman who's commenting on that picture there, she'll look at an image and she'll say, that, that's 322 Convent Avenue. You know, she knows Harlem, and when she sees pictures of Harlem, she knows what we're looking at. <laughs> the response and interpretation portion that happens in the gallery is followed by a workshop activity, a hands-on art-making session in the studio that's led by a, a teaching artist. Um, and the teaching artists I favor are those who kind of work on the, the Bank Street model, if anybody here knows what that means. Um, again, it's, it's very sort of person-centered, person-centered care, person-centered art and education, um, and also very open-ended and very much about exploration within a given framework. Um, and you're looking at the first watercolor this person has ever made. Um, very beautiful production. Um, we also work in uh, care facilities uh, when we can. Um, so what are we trying to do? You know, what, really, what, why are we doing this and what are we trying to do for people? Um, and I often refer to Tom Kitwood's model for patient centered care. Um, so Tom Kitwood, as many of you probably know, is a social psychologist who in the 1990s founded something called the Bradford Group and looked, he was really working to transform institutions. Um, and he kind of reformulated what is typically kind of understood as a pyramid, right, this famous pyramid of human needs. Um, and he reformulated it in this way. Um, and so this is something that's, uh, that's always very, very much in my mind when we design programs. So we, and, and we are actually meeting many of them. Um, people are, as I said, warmly welcomed, and so they experience inclusion we try to make sure the room is, is not too cold and not too, war not too hot, and there's also a very kind of personable atmosphere, so comfort is met. Um, the attachment between the caregivers um, is sometimes drawn closer together in that moment and sometimes given breathing space within the 90 minutes of this program. Um, and new attachments are forming between educators and the people in the, who come to the program. And really exciting attachments are forming between the front of house people, like the guards in the museum, and the people who are attending the programs. Um, it's a meaningful occupation. We're engaged with art and ideas, things that are worth spending time with. Um, and so meaningful occupation. Um, and finally, identity, because you interpret a work of art because you are who you are. So your identity is always in play, no matter where you are on the continuum of forgetfulness. Um, and when we're very lucky, love is happening as well. One caregiver told me, that part in the middle, that love bit, it should be much bigger. It should be red. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to share with you a few stories. Um, narratives, but they're, they're narratives that are about dialogue. Um, because it is really dialogue education. Um, and this is from uh, an, an early period of mine working with people with dementia here at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, I brought a group of people to look at and think about and perhaps talk about this picture with me. Um, and not very long into it, um, a woman who had very pronounced aphasia began talking to me very excitedly. She had all the intonation and all the sort of structure of, of language, but the words were not English. They were not any language. So she was speaking to me very intensely. She was saying something to me very, very important, and I couldn't understand a word of it. And all I could do was look at her and say, I know you're saying something important. Um, the program ended, I still didn't know, but moments later her, told, her husband told me that her, she had been a shepherdess in Israel mm -hmm. as a young woman. So what's wonderful about that encounter? She responded and reacted, but then her, her husband understood that importance and he got to see that. So sometimes it's about memory and sometimes it's about other things. Last summer at the Studio Museum, 
there was an exhibition called Caribbean Crossroads. And the early part of the exhibition contained historical images um, produced during periods of the slave trade. And this, I'm showing you a reproduction of a painting here, but what was in the exhibition was a, a mezzotint print of this image. So it was considerably smaller and a little bit paler in, in, in terms of color. Um, so what you see is a, is a rather brutal scene of the slave trade from 1791 rendered with all the kind of benign pictorial conventions of 18th century landscape painting. So it's a little, a little bit jarring, a little strange. So I, asked, I wasn't focusing on this, but I wanted people to know what was in the room. And so they, I asked them to filter past those pictures and to meet me uh, in front of these, uh, Toussaint Louverture series by Jacob Lawrence. Um, and one gentleman in my program, whom I've, I've known for a number of years, um, normally the chairs are sometimes in rows, and he normally sits towards the middle or the front, but this day he sat in the back. And I approached him and I said, are you sure you can see from back here? Would you like to come up? And he said to me, I just need to be back here where I can have some air and not feel as if I'm chained in a ship. You know, as an edge, this just blew my mind completely for lots of reasons. Um, so we went on, we carried on the program, and the focus shifted here. Um, and several minutes later, he, he came to the front and he kind of moved me aside. It was clear that he had something to say. He wasn't going to speak from his chair, he needed to be in the front of the room to address the group. And he related a story of, oh, this, is, this is a person who often says to me, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I nod kind of tentatively, and I think, well, I sort of, you know, I kind of do Jim Crow, right? You know? um, so he comes to the front of the room, and he tells us a story when he was a student in Richmond, Virginia, in the period of segregation, where, when it was illegal to teach black history, he had a teacher called Mr. Ramsey. And he told us the story of Mr. Ramsey gathering the students around him. And Mr. Ramsey had a set of notes. And the paper was yellowed. And the ink was brown. And the boys were huddled around as Mr. Ramsey told them the story of the only successful slave rebellion in the world. And there he was teaching us that then, at that moment. So that's a story about a lot of things. I think there's a lot going on in that. Um, a third occasion where um, we were looking at an image, this, this big sculpture by Louise Nevelson, um, large black assemblage of, made of wood, painted all entirely black. It extends from ceiling to floor. So you can, you can see how large it is here. And the moment this photo is taken, uh, the gentleman whose hand is raised, he was eight years into his diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. At that moment, he says, what are we talking about here? This is this huge, big, black, imposing image. It's called homage to Dr. Martin Luther King, but Martin Luther King was all about hope. So, you know, what, what that does to the conversation, what that does for the people in the room to hear that uh, from when the assumption might have been that a person eight years into Alzheimer's disease might, might no longer retain this kind of intellectual capacity. Um, in the studio, uh, this was probably one of the most remarkable um, events that happened. This is a, a portrait drawing workshop, right? You, you go to a, a, an art museum and suddenly a teaching artist asks you to draw a portrait. What? That's terrible. <laughs> But she's such a wonderful teaching artist, she gave everyone confidence and said, this is my job to teach you. And you, she asked the care partners to sit across the table from one another. And before they even lifted their charcoal, she said to them, Joan, look across the table. Look at Will's head. Is the, is the top of his head flat? Look at his ears. Are they against his head or do they stand out? Look at the shape of his eyebrows. And so what happened in that moment was that 
people of 50, ma married 50 years were looking at each other in a way they'd never looked at one another before. It was one of the most moving studio things I've ever seen. This is a person with a, a much more pronounced dementia. And so her drawing, it's, there's still a fate. There, there's indication of faces there. There seem to be several eyebrows. Um, and so the representation is very different. But look how proudly she shows her drawing. And then utter delight. Um, <laughs> that's his, his wife made that drawing. just want to show you some of the images of uh, art making that's happening there. This, this woman sings, has sung in choruses her whole life. She's a very, very musical person. Um, and she makes these incredibly lyrical, brilliant, gorgeous watercolor drawings. Here's another one, more imaginative maybe. A really interesting person who went to... Um, Performing Arts High School, Arts and Music High School, um, many, many years ago, um, and then had a very, very different career in the law, uh, and is coming back to art now. And another very beautiful image, and maybe a, maybe a nod to uh, Dr. Castle about the uh, idea of art being an aesthetic object, life, the life being an aesthetic object. Um, so that, in a nutshell, is the work of Arts and Minds, and a few stories about it. We'll next hear from the uh, Narrative Medicine Program uh, from Maura Spiegel. Uh, Maura Spiegel is a professor of English and, of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University and Barnard College specializing in American literature, film studies, and literature and medicine. She, uh, she is a co-author um, of The Grim Reader, Writings on Death, Dying, and Living On, as well as The Breast Book, An Intimate and Curious History. Uh, she's been co-editor-in-chief of the journal Literature and Medicine. Uh, she is a founding member of the core faculty in the program of narrative medicine at Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons. And as part of that program, she's recently done extensive work with both the Bellevue Hospital and the VA. Uh, so she'll talk about that. I, I want to give you a quick and partial explanation of what narrative medicine is for those who don't have any familiarity with it. It's really a set of methods for bringing literature and writing into healthcare contexts with the aim, surprisingly, of improving healthcare delivery. The specific aims and propositions of narrative medicine include the ideas that attention to the formal elements of, of a narrative, where a story begins, who is included in it, where gaps occur, etc., can improve one's ability to notice what might be missing, where emphasis falls, and so forth, and can increase awareness that a story or any account is shaped by context, relationality, co-construction between people, and power dynamics. That through discussion of narrative framing, how stories are constructed, perspective, distance, proximity, etc., and other devices, clinicians might more habitually bring a critical eye to the scene of care. That through writing and discussion, clinicians increase their awareness that they are a part of a story too, many stories, um, not objective receivers of information. And giving um, caregivers the license and time to construct a narrative that's not a record of an event, not clinical notes, but rather a story that can house much more than information. This, we think, is a form of nourishment. And through close reading of a literary text followed, and this is sort of our little method, which has been proven kind of Astonishing, followed by a short prompted writing and then the sharing of that writing. Caregivers and others develop better skills for listening and for being present. We call this, thank you to Sayantani Dasgupta, narrative humility. 
Um, I personally work mostly with healthcare providers and medical students and training um, our master's degree students to do the same. But others in our program work with many constituencies in many different contexts. We work in small groups usually, um, and I'm just going to list off some of the sites, um, nursing and medical schools uh, and residencies, high schoolers struggling with intestinal diseases, law students working in, in clinic with foster children aging out of the system, law students specializing in family law, social work faculty, nursing homes, residents and staff, families of women in treatment for cancer, groups of people over 50 with HIV, physical therapists, diabetes clinics, and, and many, many more. Today, briefly, I want to talk about two places that I've worked. And one of those places is the Bellevue Program for Survivors of Torture. And I have to say that I've never shared this material before, and so I'm a little um, anxious about doing that, but I, I'm going to do it. <laughs> um, uh, there's a great variability in how this work is received in the initial contact. Sometimes there's one person at the site where, we're, where we go to do these workshops um, who has urged the work on their colleagues or staff or those in their care. And sometimes the issue of gaining the trust of those we're working with um, is <laughs> significant. There, as you know, people have talked about, we're you know experiencing, particularly working with people in medicine, a very profound and interesting and un, you know, you know, much much to be said about the culture clash. Um, I'm I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem of entering into a system, um, encountering a different culture and the expectations there, um, and. Um, those of us in the humanities in this room who tread into the almost incredible density of the mental, emotional, and institutionalized lives of medical students or clinicians working with survivors of torture or with returning soldiers have thought long and hard about how you enter a system, what kinds of resistances you might expect, how you might begin to understand those resistances, and what you can learn from those resistances. In this vein, I want to tell you about um, Warren Spielberg, who is a practicing clinical psychologist and a professor at the New School University, who recently came to talk to us um, and a class of our master's students on the theme of entering a system. For many years, Warren has spent time in Israel and on the West Bank with youths on both sides of the divide, trying to bring them into dialogue, talking about and breaking down stereotypes, exploring issues of group identities, opening up avenues for communication under enormous pressure. After 9-11, Warren coordinated a project in conjunction with the fire department to bring didactic clinical and referral services to firefighters. He tells the story um, of his first visit to a firehouse in January of 2002, meeting with 30 firefighters and talking to them about trauma, grief, and depression. He said they sat in a stony silence that was so dispirited so dispiriting to him that it actually cheered him up to be told by one of the captains as he was leaving about his presentation that it sucked. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, captain, um, the captain's comment, uh, Warren commented, was the first example of aliveness I had had all day. He hadn't um, asked, Warren hadn't asked a single question. He had simply talked. And next time he went, um, he just listened. <laughs> and things then began to happen. Warren talked about the firehouses as fairly closed systems with specific codes of relating and traditions of cooperation and hierarchies and politics that are not easy to master. And of course, that's very much the case in the medical world and in many other <laughs> sites. So um, a few of us in the program um, were invited to Bellevue, um, the Bellevue NYU program for survivors of torture. I want to say a word about what it is. It was established in 1995. It's the first of its kind, treating the complex needs of survivors, bless you, of torture from over 70 countries. Survivors of torture are faced with the ongoing effects of trauma. They are often searching for relatives and coping with monumental loss, both of country and of loved ones. 
fighting immigration and legal battles, struggling with housing problems, poverty, unemployment, and ongoing medical problems. Those tasked with providing medical and psychological support to this population experience residual <laughs> vicarious or secondary trauma. And secondary trauma affecting the clinicians in turn impacts the culture of the organization feeding and growing before circling back to influence patients again. And I think we can say this of the whole demoralized medical system, um, really, that, that we're all operating in. Um, the result is a highly stressed, understaffed clinical environment where staff is frequently revolving um, as morale suffers without ways for them to nourish themselves or one another. The psychologist who was tasked with self-care at the program wanted to bring us in. They were also trying yoga and meditation, different things, to see what would help. Um, at the first meeting, we were just invited into a, a staff meeting. It, we weren't actually doing a workshop, and um, there was considerable resistance. We couldn't quite identify it beyond the feeling of, who the heck are you, and what do you know about what we do? While waiting for the elevator, it emerged when we were leaving. Um, someone explained that there's suspicion, there's a tremendous feeling of suspicion of people who become interested in the program out of a sort of salacious voyeurism. And that was what was sort of what we were feeling but couldn't name. And this um, suspicion took time to sort of wear down, but... Um, when we actually began the workshop, um, the first, very first time, we read an excerpt from Tim O'Brien's The Things They Carried. Then we asked them to write under the constraint of six minutes. Okay, so that's what we do. The prompt was to introduce their own content following the structure of O'Brien's text. And um, here are a few lines of Tim O'Brien's text in case you're not familiar with it. Um, they carried USO stationery and pencils and pens. They carried sterno, safety pins, trip flares, signal flares, spools of wire. Taking turns, they carried the big PRC-77 scrambler radio, which weighed 30 pounds with its battery. Often they carried each other, the wounded or weak. They carried infections. They carried chess sets and basketballs, Vietnamese English dictionaries, insignia of rank, bronze stars and purple hearts, plastic cards imprinted with the code of conduct, conduct. They carried lice and ringworm and leeches. And here I'd like to read one of the pieces that were written, that was, you know, this is the, this was the first one that was read aloud um, to the group. And um, uh, again, I read this with permission. I, I have to say I would never publish this um, because I didn't get the permission of the, pers of the people being talked about in these, in these pieces. So here it is. They carried... We carried the images of nuns being electrocuted in the mouth, of mothers and daughters being separated and raped, of people waking up naked not knowing what had happened to them. They, we, carried the burden of despair, hopelessness, loss of control, loss of humor. We carried the family members who were not in the room, the houses that were raided, the villages escaped to, the names of unknown countries, the sounds of foreign languages. I carry the weight of worry, Worry that some others can't carry, don't know how to pick up the pieces or pick up the wrong pieces or pick up the right piece, but don't know how to carry it. Maybe someone carries something delicate with crudeness. Maybe someone carries something crude with delicateness, but I carry the worry of what others carry. I want to snatch the load from them to ensure it's carried correctly. I want to yell at them, carry it right. I have to teach others to carry, support others carrying, while I also carry my own load. What if the load is too heavy? Ditch the load and run. So that was in six minutes. The, the richness and complexity of the text is, is something um, we attend to in responding. Um, so we might have noted at the time, although I can't recall exactly if we did, um, the sort of shift from the use of the pronoun they in the first sentence to they, we in the second, to we in the third, and finally to I for, in the remainder of the piece. The writer also shifts from the past tense to the present tense, bringing their, her patient's past, in, pasts into her present. There's a tremendous value we find in actually pointing out these formal elements to the writer. Um, I guess, Terry, you were saying that 
even simply, your phrase was realizing you are not simply what you intend, but also how complex, <laughs> how complex a piece of writing is. And so part of what we discover is that writing is very different from talking. Um, and, and, and so that's part of why we do it this way. A theme that's expressed here that developed over the course of two years working there was whom the stories belong to, and that's part of my concern here today, <laughs> sharing them with you, and if staff have a right to write or talk about the suffering that is not their own. Themes like this do not necessarily come out explicitly but are inscribed in the texts. Another of the themes that emerged in the following weeks was the participants' anxiety about their level of efficacy in treating this incredibly distressed population. And this anxiety is also evinced in this piece. Um, a piece I don't have time to read ended with, uh, after a long s- a description of an of a interview with a new, a new client, the, it ended, he returned a few minutes later with his GED prep book. He wanted me to decipher the fraction page for him. That is probably the most I can offer him. All these issues emerged in the first hour of our of meeting with this group. Um, and you know, this timed writing is sometimes almost uncannily efficient as a vehicle for expression. Um, yesterday, the question was raised about when it is not safe to tell or not really the right thing to do, and a variation of that emerged in this group. And that was that um, it was a memorable moment when one participant expressed worry that for her to write about the difficulties of the job was self-indulgent. One of her colleagues replied, There's a difference between self-indulgence and self-expression. Through witnessing, we can be a conduit rather than a container. That was an off-the-cuff remark. Um, This is another example. Another example from the first day in response to Tim O'Brien, again, with permission. It begins, take one. Ah, yes, I have a housing appointment. I am so happy it came in the mail today. What he didn't say was, but still no word of my child. Five years, and though they tell us he may be somewhere in some country, some corner in all of Africa, there is never any word. He didn't say how his wife whimpers in her sleep, keeps him up, but that they never speak of it because the pain would open up. He didn't say. Take two. He carried a bag filled with four packaged ice cream cones and another bag filled with heaps of chocolate and green wrappers, ingredients in Cyrillic. He carried a temporary identification card, the misspelled hospital red card that got him through the front doors and a newish cell phone with a 347 area code. He carried a comb in his back pocket and his mother's rosary in his front. Um, And I'm just going to skip a piece of this, although it's all quite remarkable. Um, He carried a fantasy that he and his doctor would leave that office and take a trip to Niagara Falls. He carried his good head and better than average English for a newcomer to New York City. He carried these things hoping they would. And then there's just an ellipsis. He couldn't finish that sentence. Two minutes, okay. Um, basically, my, what I'm trying to get to, so I'll just jump forward, is over time what we realized in working with this group was that they really didn't want to t- talk about their clients. And so part of the listening for us and using sort of narrative medicine as a way to elicit what they needed and to help break down that resistance was to realize that what they needed was a place to, that in fact part of what had happened in their secondary trauma was um, uh, a sense that their relation to their own emotions and to the world they lived in had changed and had sort of lost its vitality. So they started to write about themselves and their lives, and interestingly, often about their mothers was a big thing. Um, but but this, um, this shift, and so we brought in material that would move them in that direction and gave them prompts to move in that direction. And um, they sort of collectively let us know what they needed, and it was a place for self-care, a kind of, you know, recognizing the sort of ethical demands. Um, I don't have time to talk a lot about the VA, just to say that when um, there was, we did a workshop in New York with the VA, people who were sort of selected uh, came for a weekend, and uh, it was quite remarkable. 
um, they liked it so much. So we were invited down to Washington, which is where this VA was, this VA hospital. And it was very striking for one thing that um, they were near their own hospital and they, between sessions, were running to the hospital and the environment completely different than, than leaving their context. To, uh, so these questions, and when the first large plenary session happened, um, about 100, I don't know, 150 people came into a much bigger room than this. For um, I was up first, the technology <laughs> failed, I was showing film clips. But what I felt in the room was basically this. And I learned only later that not only had they been required to come, of course, but that this had been the fourth, um, the fourth day-long, um, uh, you know, requirement for um, for them within the past six months, and that two of them had been um, given by the Disney Institute, and you know, the Disney's approach to quality service. Um, uh, and customer satisfaction, and customer satisfaction was the VA's term, not just the Disney term. And so, I just wanted to say that the sort of this business model that prevails everywhere, and this part, this sense of their resentment about what are you doing now, what do we have to do now, <laughs> is really the language is so divorced from their experience in the clinic and what is of value to them and what they do. So, what we were able to do, and the atmosphere changed dramatically when they saw that what we wanted to do was hear what they, their language and give them a place to, to speak in their language. And, and that's really, um, that's really, I'll just uh, stop there. Okay. We'll next hear from the Hubbard Project. And we'll have three presenters. This is going to be a team presentation. Um, and I'll introduce all three at once. Uh, Susan Coppola is a professor of occupational science at UNC Chapel Hill, teaching in the areas of OT practice environments and aging. Her published work, teaching, and service have focused on meaningful occupations of older adults and best practices in gerontology. She has chaired the panel to develop national board certification in gerontology for occupational therapists. She also develops and participates in interdisciplinary geriatric education with a certificate in aging advisory board and with the Hubbard program, which trains students from the health sciences to better understand the home and family as context for care decisions. Sherry Rosemond is um, is a research scientist at UNC's Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention. She is a founding member of the current conception of the Hubbard Program of Collaborative Clinical Care in Geriatrics. She's also a program advisor to Beyond Clinical Walls, which serves community members with complex medical social needs and has been awarded a Senior Service of America grant to investigate the potential for older workers to be employed in health sector jobs. Her research interests are related to the long-term care experiences of older adults and is directed towards the effective implementation of new programs to improve quality of their care in nursing homes and hospice organizations. And our third presenter, Jane Thrailkill, is Bowman and Gordon Gray Distinguished Term Associate Professor of English and Comparative Literature at UNC Chapel Hill, where she teaches American literature, crit critical theory, and medical humanities. She's the author of Affecting Fictions, Mind, Body, and Emotion in American Literary Re Realism, and is currently at work on a monograph titled Darwin's Children, which which examines the centrality of evolutionary theory to the depiction of child consciousness in poetry, psychology, and narrative fiction. Her articles have, have appeared in Neurology and Modernity, English Literary History, Journal of Narrative Theory, American Literature and Poetics Today. She's currently developing interdisciplinary courses for a new graduate program at UNC in Literature, Medicine, and Culture. to join you and 
I would like to say right off that the version of Hubbard that you'll hear about today was in existence for 13 years. And we lost our funding in 2010. And I want you to know that um, there is tremendous will, and we are reinventing the program in two different forms. And I think it's fair to say, I represent Jane and Sue, to say that the things that we've learned here at this conference and the interactions we've had have only shored up that will to reinvent this program. The Hubbard program is an interdisciplinary, home-based service learning program that is focused on health and health care for older adults living in our community. The term interdisciplinary can be used quite loosely, and I want to explain more about what we mean by that. We are going into people's homes. It provides a context for what we learn that is unlike anything our students experience in their clinical training. We have debated whether this is service or learning, whether it's a training program or a service program, and we've decided it's both. I think if you pushed us, we would say that this is primarily a training program for our interdisciplinary students. We focus on older adults in our community who are often in transition, maybe facing moving out of their home into a nursing home. We, are, uh, re we receive referrals from physicians in our community, from home health care providers, and from social workers primarily. And our work is, has been supported, was supported for 13 years by the Hubbard Memorial Fund. And Dr. Hubbard was the dean of the School of Medicine at University of Michigan. And we understand that his family included a social worker and a nurse. And that it was out around their dinnertime conversations that the idea to support inter interdisciplinary training came forth. It's obvious that um, we believe health is more than the absence of disease. When we are with our clients, we hear about their physical their mental, their emotional, spiritual. Um, we learn about their environment. And increasingly, we are hearing about their financial concerns. We have also we conceptualized Hubbard and, and implemented it around the notion that clinical practice in the way we know it now in healthcare is specialized, it's hierarchical and it's fragmented. And patients and clients experience the fragmentation as they're bounced from clinician to clinician, and providers experience that fragmentation and alienation from each other. And we just believe that we have a lot to learn from each other. We believe that we do our best work for our patients when we understand first their concerns. We understand their history, their strengths, their needs, their preferences, and as Dr. Cassell has mentioned, their goals and their purposes. So a little bit about what we do and what it looks like. We have faculty and student teams working together elbow to elbow over the course of the semester. So this is a, a program that's really about depth and not um, about skimming the surface. So the student teams and the faculty teams work together for a full semester. You see the list of uh, the disciplines that are represented. On the left are the clinical disciplines. We, uh, our semester teams usually include four to five students from any one of these disciplines at a time. And the, on your right, you'll see faculty members that are um, guests over one or two or three sessions. Uh, Jane will tell you about her experience in working with us uh, from a comparative literature perspective. Michelle Rivkin Fish works with us as a medical anthropologist. She encourages us to think about moral economies of health and to read Meredith Minkler and Holstein's work. The, we also have a faculty from public administration. We want, we're very concerned about what's going on in our community that's outside of our hospital and outside of our clinic. So we want to bring that uh, also to the table. And as well, the public health perspective believing that uh, as, a, as our population is healthier, we all benefit. 
A typical day for us uh, starts uh, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon once a week. We meet at a retirement community as a team, and one student is uh, for the day that we have rotating leadership between the students. So one team member is uh, responsible for being lead that day, which means that they've gathered the chart information, the medical chart, and that's presented, and out of that, um, understanding, we start thinking about, well, as a physical therapist, I might want to do a falls assessment today. The pharmacist may think, I don't know why there are three blood pressure medicines on board. So that's the kind of conversation that starts our day. And then we load up in the Hubbard Mobile, and we all tra we travel together, and we go into the client's home. And one of the tenets of our program that we hear over and over again is what we learn from the chart is almost invariably dramatically different than what happens when we walk into the front door of our client's home. So that is a learning point in itself for our students to see that what they read in the chart and the assumptions they make are, can be vastly different when you're actually a guest in someone's home. We focus on client strengths and our recommendations are written up in a, um, in a form of a letter that we write back to the client and to their family. And also, uh, this letter goes into their medical chart. We spend about an hour and a half at the home, and then we go back to our um, retirement community location, and we talk for about an hour. And we promise to end at 5, and we rarely end at 5. So this is really evidence that this is an in-depth, lots of conversation happening. And um, the faculty really takes a back seat. The students are sharing their observations, and it's in the questions that we ask each other where information comes forward that's so important to frame not what are the complaints and the concerns, but what are the strengths that the patient, the client, and their family, who is often there at the visit, bring to the setting. The, I want to just mention that the home setting is incredibly important for us. What we learn and what we see from our different viewpoints brings so much to the story. And we begin to understand that the community and the home and the family are incredibly important in thinking about decisions about care. And this context is, is very meaningful to us. We hear back from our clients. We do a formal evaluation, both from the client perspective, also from the student perspective. But we hear from our clients often that they could sense how much desire we had in learning about them and that that means something to them. They understand that we believe them and we're, we're really listening carefully. And so we often get comments back like the one you read here. From a student perspective, we also um, have surprises, but the this is a quote from one of our nursing nu nutrition students. What does this thing have a mind of its own? Um, it says, because of my Hubbard experience, I began to see interdisciplinary service delivery as critical for improving the quality of care for older adults with complex needs. If we attempt to operate in isolation, we will only see part of our patient stories and therefore only arrive at partial solutions. The one critique of the program is that this isn't real world. How often do you get to go elbow to elbow with a group of people from four or five other disciplines? And our response to that is that we realize that this isn't a real world situation it is now. It's one we'd like to imagine. Um, but we have seen that the students that go through the program often have a thirst for a team. And they will say to us, I don't, I'm going to look for a team when I'm looking for a job, or I'm going to find a team wherever I go. And a last quote from a pharmacy student, providing effective care may require you to look beyond the boundaries of your treatment. It's necessary to ask broader questions about clients' lives to find out other ways to make a difference, not only in function but in the quality of life. 
and it's particularly important to me that this was a pharmacy student. They um, think of themselves as having a fairly prescriptive and prescribed, no pun intended, role. And um, pharmacy students in particular, are um, their boundaries are pushed wide by their experience with Hubbard. So I'm going to turn this over to Sue. You can wrestle with this. Um, Great. OK. Um, I'd like to uh, take a moment and take stock of the tremendous amount of concepts that have been presented in the last day and a half to say that we do not have anything new to say because there are so many ideas that have come out through the literature and the exploration which you've said which were already our plan for what we were going to say to you. So it's affirming. And um, what I'd like to do is give you a little bit of an idea of uh, my point of entry as an occupational therapist to this whole concept of bringing uh, concepts from narrative into uh, ways of thinking about practice and teamwork. And it, uh, much of it comes from the early work of Cheryl Mattingly, who studied occupational therapists and, and explored how the phenomenological body was very more important uh, and as important as the biomedical one, and that the meanings that clients make of illness are, um, are very much entering into our process with them in terms of how we're going to go forward and do things with them. And, and yet therapists are con constantly confronted with uh, the challenge of seeing uh, the client's way of thinking and getting their own way of thinking sort of out of the way. And it's through narrative that we're able to do a lot better job of that. Um, so uh, on the team, uh, by bringing a little bit more of this perspective, and, and, and a lot of what we hope to share with you is the our experience as faculty in terms of interacting about new concepts and constructing things like inviting Jane to join us uh, in the um, to bring a narrative to our discussions um, is, is what we really want to share. And so these things are happening on the faculty level and the, and the student level. Um, and then also how we're looking at the clients when we enter the home. So some of these points that I've been hearing you all say are wonderful percent presenters are that the object of study is not the person. It is the situation. It's not the environment. It is the situation. It's the transaction between the person who is part of the environment, not, a, not just being contained by them. Um, and, that, and that these are bounded by habits, routines, and their whole processes of deliberation about how they're going to spend their time, what medicines they're going to take, and so forth. So we need to understand that, that, uh, that transaction. Um, we also, uh, again, look at the home as an object of study, um, as part of the object, and that the thought that the places and objects are telling stories of what has transpired there or what might happen there. And then again, this point that was mentioned earlier about temporality, like the endpoints, they're not finite endpoints. With this, with going into homes, we are now unbounded in time because we need to be seeing their past, present, and future all together. And we do that by just simple questions like, how do you spend your days? Or describe a typical day. So what I'm going to do now is take you with me to, um, oh, let's see, I do not see this. to meet one of our clients. Here we go. I'm good. OK. What do you see? A kitchen. A fireplace. A, fireplace. a, man, and a, woman. a man and a woman. Water. Water. Check tablecloth. Check tablecloth. Old structure, log cabin. High ceilings. High ceilings. Not a lot of natural light. Not a lot of natural light. Nice tablecloth. Nice tablecloth. Kind of a cozy place. Cozy place. A home. So um, we're drowning in data, folks. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's so, there's so much information in this one picture. And so when you think about this interdisciplinary coming into the home and discovering things like, oh, this is where the medicines are kept, along with the bills. And this is where the oxygen place, uh, thing is next to where Mr. M sits and smokes. 
And what, and what, you know, so there's so much information going on here. It is a, it is a paradise for an OT to go into here because there's, there's so much happening. So, um, so the first point is just that there's, there's tremendous amount of information we've got to figure out what to focus on. And then this point that was made about we have cognitive limits. There's only so much we can take in. So um, let's watch a little bit more. I don't have sound on, but I can tell you what Mr. M said. He said, I'm listing to port. <laughs> I'm listing to port. I suppose. <laughs> yeah. See, and there's, I mean, that takes you on that string of the story. And why does he wear these socks? Well, he was in the war, and he had to walk through the snow as a prisoner of war, and so his feet are painful. So there is there is so much in that. Um, sorry? She has a walker, but he doesn't use it. Okay. Excellent observation. He walked past walkers. He walked past about... $8,000 worth of medical equipment. There was, a, there was a power chair in there that someone prescribed without looking at the house. I mean, it just goes on and on. So this is the kind of rich conversations that we have with our students. Once we have this kind of material to work with, it never fails to be very rich. Um, let's see. So just a couple of uh, more um, uh, comments, um, just this whole thing of narrative, organizing the team around just tremendous amounts of information, bringing in different disciplines, perspectives, and human perspectives, finding the intersections of how maybe the social worker needs to talk with the pharmacist about how they're going to get the pills, and maybe that wasn't didn't make sense for the person, um, creating synergies and being able to establish priorities because there is so much that could be done here, but what should be done. Um, and we do, as Sherry mentioned, enact the limits of the medical chart every time and realize how much it falls short. But in the end, what we find is the teams, team members do feel part of something that matters. So that alienation of labor is something that I think we really are overcoming very much in this process. So now, Jane. Um, so uh, when Sue and Sherry asked me to be a part of this, of course, I wondered what was the value added that I would bring to this amazing group of students. So OT students, um, public health students, nursing students who had all of this expertise. And I think drawing a page from Rita Sharon and um, the work of many of the people in the room, I thought, well, I'll bring the skill of um, the literary scholar, and I can have them read, and I can have them um, develop techniques of close reading. And we'll see where that goes. So the first story that I had the students read um, is this, it, it felt important that it be short. So I had the students read a short story by Susan Glassbell called A Jury of Her Peers, um, which is a, a story about um, a murder, I suppose, and um, a bunch of men go into a home. Sorry, spoiler alert. A bunch of men go into a home, a detective and so on, to find out why there's a dead body in the home. There's a man who's dead. Um, and as I recall, they go upstairs, and the men gather to figure it out to the scene of the crime. And it's a, a kind of forensic story. Meanwhile, the women gather on the first floor, and they start observing in the way that my OT colleagues have taught me is really important. They start observing what's going on in the house. And they, of course, um, solve the mystery, if you will. They solve the mystery of whom, who murdered the, the man upstairs. Um, so I thought this was an occasion that was both, um, it foregrounded questions of epistemology, how we make meaning, what, what counts as evidence, um, what, uh, what is the object of study um, in two different ways. Um, and to some extent, I thought I went into this program thinking um, the men upstairs are allegorical for medicine to some extent. You know, we've got to find the, the single source um, that caused this trouble. Um, the women downstairs sort of moving and circulating and observing um, were a, a sort of alternate epistemology, more phenomenological, perhaps a woman's way of knowing. What was fabulous in being involved with the Hubbard Project is I realized that this story was not allegorical. Um, the women observed the home. 
um, the women collectively brought to bear their differing perspectives on what they saw. And they, um, they came to a, a resonant final thought that about what had happened and what should happen from there. So it wasn't just about who did it. It was what's next. So I suddenly realized it's a recapitulation of what happens every day in the Hubbard Project, a going in, a thinking um, that you have, you, you, bring, you work from your expertise, you bring your knowledge. The experience itself teaches you so much. Um, in that story, there was, in a sense, no protagonist. The woman of the house was in jail. Um, so what's different, of course, luckily, about the Hubbard is um, the person uh, who, we get to talk to that person. And that person is a part of the dialogue, a discussion of the, the aims and purposes. So think again about this two-story house. Such a great image of hierarchy. The guys upstairs figuring it out, the women waiting downstairs, waiting, waiting, waiting. Um, and what turns out to happen is it's in the gathering downstairs where the thinking um, and the thinking and the concern and the decision about care occurs. They start to understand the past. They can see traces of this woman's past in, in the house, in the structures, in the evidence. Um, so what I took from that and what I take from Hubbard is this notion that Andy Clark, who's a cognitive philosopher, talks about us usefully <laughs> and creepily as skin bags. So here we are. We have this boundary, human beings. And all too often, that's what's looked at and probed and dug into and so on by medical care. Um, what this story and what Hubbard, um, I think, helps to show is that the self extends into the environment, so it extends spatially into the walker that's not used, into the you know, massive amounts of medications here, into the rug that is or is not tripped over, and so on. The, the self extends into space. It also extends into relationships. The woman in the house was a very important part mm -hmm. of the listening man's experience. Um, and so it extends in space and time. And that attentiveness to, that that's the object, if you will, of care and concern. Not the object of analysis, but of care and concern. So I guess um, I went in thinking that I could assist by bringing some of the interpretive methods um, to my colleagues um, on the other side of campus at UNC, on the medical side, as opposed to the College of Arts and Sciences. What I found um, is that I drew so much from the work that they are doing, that a lot of the work I am now doing involves the concepts that I've drawn from Sherry and Sue. So it's a reciprocity between and among the people involved. It is a training program. This is not ongoing care. It's, it's a homeopathic dose of what, what, what could be in terms of an idealized medical encounter. Mm -hmm. um, it is lateral, um, it is not hierarchical, and the students get a taste of possibility with this that they then, we hope, take back to their futures because they're young, right? They tend to be 22, 24. Um, they're in training. So it's, um, what? It's an it's a imagination of a possible future. And along the way, we get to meet people in the community and learn from the people in the community. And then I guess the one last thing I'll say, and I could speak to this more, but I should then stop. Um, part of what was interesting about this for me, my own parents were in an assisted living place. Um, my dad had Parkinson's. My mom, serious back trouble and dementia. My mom was Hubbardized, and I got to bear witness to that. Absolutely extraordinary experience to watch it and to see the circle, the students in the circle, my mom in the circle, and I saw her turn back into the southern grand dame that 
she is. And she, you know, welcome, she said, <laughs> something to that effect. And she, and she said to Sherry and Sue, do you know each other? Can I introduce you? Do you know? So it drew on. Um, it totally gave her an opportunity to enact the woman that, that she is, that she was, that she uh, believes herself to be. Um, so it was beautiful in that regard. It was so much not a cognitive test, Right? Do you recognize these scissors? Could you imagine if we went around our life giving people cognitive tests all the time? I mean, if someone tried to come up to you and give you a cognitive test, you would kick them, right? It's so obnoxious. These guys go into the house, and they talk. That's what human beings do. And And they exchange, and they laugh, and they probe, and they allow, in my mom's case, they allowed her to probe. Anyway, I've said enough, but um, it's a very rich project, 13 years, fabulous, Um, we would all be so lucky to have this sort of program continue. And could we, uh, how do we raise the lights? Uh, That would be great. Um, I can do that. Fantastic. So let's open up to... uh, (laughs) To questions, so if you have questions, please come up, uh, I guess, to the microphones oh, sure. and, and, and ask them. You should grab your Caroline. You can put that, leave that picture up. Well, as, as other questions are right, um, I guess one question I would love uh, to, for people to explore, uh, the two sets of questions, I have so many observations that are sort of shared, but I'd like to hear more about how, um, how each uh, project understands the role of the imagination in, in the sort of uh, health, medical, science, and perhaps ethics work that they're doing. Uh, we heard more about that in the Hubbard project, but we can hear quite a bit from the first two um, and then go from there. There's a, uh, a woman who, from Wisconsin called Ann Basting who runs a program called Time Slips. And she, what she said about this was to uh, replace the pressure to, Im- to remember with the freedom to imagine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so it's exactly counter to the kind of thing that Jane was just describing, right? It's not a cognitive test. Mm-hmm. It's what, whatever you think it is. Well, I wouldn't say that because I, I'm working against the idea that art is whatever you think it is. Um, but uh, there's freedom, and you are who you are, and you get to say what you wish to say. Mm-hmm. Um, imagination seems utterly crucial. Um, for those of you who've read Pat Barker's wonderful novel, Regeneration, Siegfried Sassoon's um, statement against the war at a certain point, Eileen, maybe you'll remember it exactly, but it goes something like this. Um, I, I'm standing up, I'm speaking against the war, against those who, who lack the imagination to understand the suffering of the men on the battlefield, something to that effect. I mean, his critique was a total lack of imagination of someone else's experience. And this, I think, is this notion of recognition. It is so not about, oh, does he recognize you? Does she recognize you? Mm -hmm. As we heard, it's all about, do you recognize that person? And the truth is, in any encounter, it takes a leap of imagination. You know, we are in our separate worlds. Um, So I think that's utterly, utterly crucial, this issue of imagining and imagining what's there, imagining what's not there. Imagine this person, you know, who's now old, um, as um, a fabulous tennis player, you know, as a dashing person. Um, A friend of mine said that her husband, who was uh, at Duke, not UNC, um, uh, he had throat cancer. Um, he was at the end of his life. And um, the doctor said, oh, by the way, Steve, what, what do you do for a living? 
Steve was a singer. He had throat cancer. He had, you know, the notion, and a raconteur, the notion that those, the people looking after him didn't know the meaning of throat cancer for this man. So, yeah, imagination. I would just like to add that I think the variety and the sensitive questions that our students and our faculty ask our Hubbard participants gives them some imagination. When they are asked about what do you eat and how do you spend your time and those questions, that are the everyday questions put a spotlight on things that they might imagine differently. That was close to what I was going to oh, say. Oh, we've been working we, together. We, I know. But we, there's a term that we meant to say, and it's collective cognition, and that our process is having a shared cognition about what the situation is, what story we're in. And, um, and we do find we do this sort of thing. <laughs> um, I, I'm so struck by, you know, the, make, the use that you make of the home and of, you know, the mode of inhabiting and how it thickens you know, the narrative, I mean, in so many ways. And so it, it, it feels, you know, deeply connected to how I think of putting a poem or something in front of a group of people who's, in many ways, are very starved for um, a kind of language to express what they experience every day and, you know, never, ever f- put language to. Um, and just that experience of putting language to things um, is so powerful, um, and is an act of the imagination. Can I add just one thing? um, The people we see have different amounts of imagination and deliberation processes, so it's really, our job is to understand their imagination, to suggest, but to more learn them and learn what's inside of them, so that's a key place. I mean, this is related to uh, Sir Carolyn's point that that struck me. A moment when you're asking one to draw or to paint in an art museum, and so it, for me, it brought up questions that are practice questions, or, or in, about how do you instill confidence in in people, students, um, patients, to do something in an environment or in a space that may intimidate. Um, to you, you assign maybe a piece of fiction, and they're supposed to write fiction, and they're intimidated by the piece of fiction itself. Same thing may happen in an art museum. So how does one go about do so in your in your respective environments? Yeah, well, it's very much about removing intimidation, right? right? So uh, in terms of the aesthetic experience component, and when I say that, I mean the encounter with the work of art on the walls of the museum. Um, you you own your interpretation. Um, and we read the picture collectively. So there's a, there's a half an hour spent there. And I think there's something very important uh, that I don't fully understand that happens in the encounter among the people and with the work of art. There's something very rich going on there on many sort of human levels. Um, and so when that goes well, that removes intimidation to a very large degree. Um, Now that said, in the Studio Museum in Harlem, where there's often very contemporary work, abstract work, conceptual work, sculptures made out of pantyhose tied together, t-shirts tied together hanging from the ceiling, uh, there there can be a lot of skepticism looking at that. And they're like, I'm plenty confident. I can do that, you know, easily. Uh, But it's it's very much about... um, drawing meaning, so much about the Mm -hmm. meaning. Mm -hmm. Um, And so one of these t-shirt tied together type uh, sculptures that I'm talking about was made by a man called John Outerbridge who worked at the Watts Towers in LA for many years. And they, these people in my group who are um, almost entirely in their 60s and 70s were, we don't know what, this is some young artist. I said, well, you know, this artist was born in 1936. Total transformation. Oh, he's not throwing out the rags. He's saving them. This is about it. it changed the whole thing. So it's in it's in that uh, that dialogue with the art itself that mm. confidence can be built. Um, and then this the workshop component happens in the hands of 
skilled mm -hmm. art teachers, mm -hmm. professional teaching artists who know materials and uh, get the participants excited about the material. So the, the, the tactility of the paper, of the brush, of the paint, and, all, and there's music playing, and mm -hmm. so all of this to ameliorate that. Mm -hmm. And it's a process, mm -hmm. and it doesn't always happen in session one. <laughs> The thing I've really enjoyed about the Hubbard is everyone is the expert of their own home. So it's not only, oh, they're comfortable there. That's very simplistic to me. There's an expertise there. There's an expertise built into the home. Hmm. They can explain to you how they negotiate dinner or a meal or how they organize their pills and so on. Um, I, I wouldn't know how to do that. So there's an honest... Um, a sense of drawing on expertise. And then as you talk about something that someone feels good about and strong about, you learn a lot about who they are, what profession they, they mm -hmm. did, you know, mm -hmm. what they care about, mm -hmm. um, who's involved in helping them every day. So mm -hmm. um, the home, I think, for the Hubbard Project, the home is utterly key because mm -hmm. of that notion that you're the captain of your, your home ship, in a way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and more um, oh in, in a lot of a lot of it is the time constraint you know it's uh, you know you have three minutes so, you so it know, just makes it you feel it, it makes it, it, it it sort of lifts the masterpiece mm -hmm. you know I think this concept of empowerment uh, came up yesterday a fair amount, but it, we really, our, our, our subtle goal is to build a sense of identity and empowerment. Um, and so we do, in the process of people telling us what they're good at and demonstrating how they do things at home perfectly well, even though the mini mental status test was 20 out of 30, um, it is, I think, really makes them feel good. The letter that we write to the uh, people that we visit that follows emphasizes we were so impressed when we saw you did this and how smart of you to have thought of that and how you worked this out and we were so impressed at your background and then we would hear some suggestions if you're interested <laughs> sort of thing mm -hmm. so we really are um, trying to build up a sense of, of pride confidence and empowerment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for this panel. This was really fascinating. I, um, I think this question is largely for Carolyn, because in the other two talks, I heard an emphasis on you know, how literature and the arts and these kind of human connections you're forging help people to deal with experiences of loss and trauma and transition Carolyn, your talk, it was very, it's very uplifting what you're doing, but I imagine the people in the program are also struggling with a similar feeling of loss and confusion and confronting of limitations. So I'm wondering if that's also something that you deal with in their experience of the artwork. So what you think that encounter both with the art and the art making does mm -hmm. for the participants and the caregivers. Okay, so um, I think it's doing a number of things and very importantly, engaging with things that matter, as I said. So looking at art, talking about art, and in that process, realizing one's own preserved faculties. Right. So they feel themselves in possession of their vocabulary or not yet they're listened to. I mean, there, there are people in the program who sit in the wheelchair and say nothing, um, but they are in a space where this positive activity is happening and it's, it's not idle chit-chat mm -hmm. um, and the art making is not popsicle sticks and glitter. Um, it's all, you know, very seriously dealt with. And so... I guess so. There are a number of things that I think this this may do for people. So there there was a study from Iowa in 2010 about the the uh, emotions outlast the memory of the stimulus. So I'm sure some of you are, are familiar with this work. So what it showed was that um, 
I, we came to the museum. We talked about works of art. It was very uplifting. We had a wonderful time. I left the museum. I didn't remember a thing. Nevertheless, that elevated mood persists over time. And if the elevated mood persists over time, the bus ride home may be easier. The caregiver may have an easier time dealing with the dinner and bedtime routine. So the idea is to come out of isolation, be engaged with something that matters, lift the spirits, improve the mood, hopefully, um, and then build on this and continue to have kind of hopefully improved well-being over time. I don't know if that satisfies. Yeah. Do we have other questions? No. Okay. Um, That's what I was wondering. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we were kind of pushing it off. But we do have two YouTube systems. Oh. So, that's a good Oh, fantastic. <laughs> All right. So, let's thank the panel. Thank you.